Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up Laplace transforms. That is, we're going to talk about, so this is 3050, week two, lecture one. So wrap up Laplace. But first, please turn in your homeworks. So turn in homework ones. Homework ones. Now your homework two is due tomorrow. It's not that difficult, okay, in the sense there are two problems. Um, let's see. Six and seven from chapter two. So seven should be very straightforward. Six involves the use of MATLAB. I'll talk about it uh, later today, of course. But I don't know if I can record it because my... Um, I'll try, right? If not, I'll write down what you have to do. The commands are very easy. It's, uh, but I'll see if I can demo it. Okay. Anyway, so turn in homework one. Uh, second, today what we're going to do is, A, we're going to talk about the Dirac delta function. Okay. Second, we're going to talk about inverse Laplace transforms. But this is with partial fraction expansion. Again, we're not going to use the definition of the inverse Laplace transform because it involves a 2D complex contour integration. Uh, Dirac delta. And it's not necessary to do that for our course. Yeah, question? So the question is on the exam, will you be allowed to have a Laplace transform table? It's not necessary because I'll give you one. I'll give you the necessary stuff, but that's a good question which Chris asked. You should know the Laplace transform of standard functions. For example, the Laplace transform of the unit step is one over S. That you should know, right? The sine and the cosine, also you should know, but I'll give that if that do that comes around. Uh, let's see, Dirac delta function, inverse Laplace transforms, and finally, the concept of a transfer function. Okay, so let's get started with the Dirac delta function. So the Dirac delta function is also called as an impulse function, is a mathematical abstraction, okay? So it's actually a function that we cannot graph, technically speaking, but we'll have a representation for it. So impulse function is a mathematical abstraction that, uh, what is, that models a physical, so I'll put in physical impulse in quotes because as we will draw, so here's how you draw the delta function, okay? So delta of T, this has I, ideally zero, so this is with time, okay? So this is delta, if you will. Delta of t ideally zero width and infinite magnitude. So that's why it's a mathematical abstraction. Okay. But what is the use of the delta function? The usefulness. Basically, the delta function came about from physics. Okay. So the Dirac, uh, Paul Dirac. Does anybody know what the delta function is used for in physics? That's where it comes from. It models something in physics. Yeah. Not a switch. Not like, I'm talking about particle physics. Not a switch. No, particles. So what's the most fundamental idea that you learned in well, engineering behind particles? Like you use in circuits, for example, like So what? So in other words, it basically models point charges. That's where it comes from. Okay. So the usefulness, but the usefulness of delta of t for us is because of something called as the sifting, not shifting, sifting property. Okay. So in other words, if I have minus infinity, if I integrate the delta function, okay at some a. So this delta function doesn't have to be at zero, okay? It can move around. So it can be delta of t minus a, delta of t plus a, assuming a is positive, yes? I don't, I, I need not have a spike at zero. 
but the point is let's say it does move around there it goes mine's crashed again so it moves around and I multiply it by a function so this is tau okay so in other words I have a spike at uh, it's sifting s i f t i n g it's like it sifts through basically this integral is equal to f of a so in other words if i have a spike at some point and i have a i have that spike multiplied by a function i integrate okay what matters is the function value at where the spike is because everywhere else the delta function is zero this is hard to prove mathematically i'm not going to prove it but if you want to prove it stop by office hours and i'll prove it but this is something that's easy to remember intuitively okay that what matters is when the spike occurs so how the heck is that useful well consider now the laplace transform of delta okay the laplace transform of delta is an s domain function so from the definition this is tau going from minus infinity to infinity delta of tau e to the minus s tau d tau yes so what's this using the sifting property okay where does the spike occur at what a value zero so uh, basically t equals zero so what is our f of tau is e to the minus s tau yes so what's the value of this yes it's one so in other words the laplace transform of the delta function is identically one in other words the delta function contains all frequencies okay it's a very very useful theoretical tool but there is another thing there are other not only one item but there are other items that pop out of this okay for example also note that the integral of the delta function whoops so this is tau going from 0 minus to infinity is basically the unit step function okay so in other words so here is delta of t if I integrate, I basically get a step at zero, okay, because this is discontinuous. So in other words, discontinuities are nicely modeled by delta functions. That's what Scott was alluding to earlier. But it's not why the delta function came about. Right? It came about in particle physics to model point charges. And Dirac was a physicist or is a physicist. Okay. So anyway, so if you differentiate the unit step function, you get the delta function okay so and we'll see some other properties of delta function but for now the most important property that you need to remember is the laplace transform of the direct delta function is one it contains all frequencies okay never forget this and it comes out um, comes about because of the sifting property all right now let's look at something less esoteric which is the inverse laplace transform So we will use partial fraction expansion. That's how we'll find it. And tables 2.1 and 2.2, okay? So actually, going back to Chris's question about Laplace transforms, on the exam, right, I was just thinking about this. What I'll ask you, so exam one, is in week four basically what i'll ask you is here's a system set up the s domain equations that describe this system so you really won't be taking any laplace transforms per se there might be one question on it okay and it'll basically involve the properties of laplace laplace transforms like do you really understand that basically this right that the laplace transform of the direct delta function is one 
So I won't really directly ask you to use the definition. So you have to think. Anyway, getting back. So we'll use partial fraction expansion tables 2.1, 2.2. .2. So let's look at an example. This is skill assessment 2.2 on page 44. Let me see if I can cut and paste like I did last time. Forty-four, thirty-six, thirty-seven. So, under your book has a lot of examples on partial fraction expansion. You should go through it. Uh, let's see. I'll do like one, just the skill assessment exercise. Let's see what he asks. Okay. So, I'll recall that last time. Whoops. So I'm just going to write it down. So skeleton exercise on page 44 is find inverse Laplace transform. And you can actually do this on your calculators, although I don't allow calculators on the exam. This is basically mechanical, right? You should do a few so you get the idea of the algebra. This plus 3 whole squared. Yep. So the solution is well, obviously first let 10 over s times s plus 2 times s plus 3 the whole squared is what? How do you remember? How do you split this up? So it's obviously a over s, okay? Then what? Okay, so it turns out that this is not the actual partial fraction expansion. So what you need is this, okay? Suppose, yeah, question? Okay, suppose you wrote A over S plus B over S plus 2 plus C over S plus 3 squared, and you try to get A, B, C, okay? It won't come out. Or let's say you add an extra term, then this, for example, this B could be zero, okay? So basically it's just, expanding this as partial fractions. It's nothing magical. Okay. So let's just uh, find out what A, B, C, and D are. So cross multiply. And let's see. B times S times S plus 3 squared plus C times S times S plus 2 times S plus 3 plus D times S times S plus 2. Okay? So now what we will do is we'll choose different values for s. Recall that s can be complex. So you can put complex numbers in here, but in this case, it's not necessary. So first, let's see. Let s equal 0. That's a standard value. That should take out this, this, this. Okay. So if you let s equal 0, on the left-hand side, you still have 10. Yes. On the right-hand side, you have a times, let's see. This is 2 times 9. Yes. 2 times 9. Therefore, A is what? 5 over 9. Let's see if that's what I got. Yeah. Okay? A is 5 over 9. Then what? Give me another value for S. Minus 3. Converse is minus 3. So let's see what happens. Left hand side is still 10. So A goes, B goes, C goes, D is there. So D is minus 3 times minus 1. Yes. So D is 10 thirds. Is that what I got? Yeah, that's what I got. Another one. Let us equals minus 2. So left hand side is still 10. So A goes, B doesn't go. So B is minus 2 times 1 squared. C goes, D goes. Therefore, B is negative 5. Yes? So we found A, D, B. We have to find C. So how can I find C? What's one way to find C? So you could compare coefficients, or you can try putting in complex numbers, but this is just easier, of s cubed, okay, on both sides. What's the coefficient of s cubed on the left-hand side? Zero, okay. What about on the right-hand side? Just be careful. See, there's an s squared and s cubed coming from here. 
So it's just weighted by A, all right? There's an S cubed coming from here, yes? There should be one, right? That's just B. Then obviously there should be C. There's no contribution from D, yes? So we know what A and B are. So C is just negative A minus B. I already computed this. Well, we can just do it. So it's 5 minus, well, negative 5 ninths plus 5, yes? This implies C is going to be 40 over 9. Okay? Question? C is 40 over 9. Okay? Therefore, well, this is the partial fraction expansion. Therefore, f of s is basically a over s, which is 5 ninths over s, plus b is what? Negative 5 over s plus 2. Okay. Plus c is 40 over 9. I think I put c as s plus 3. Yes. Plus d is what? 10 over 3. s plus 3 whole squared. This implies now the inverse Laplace transform simply using the table is going to be 5 over 9s. This is going to be u of t, okay, turns out. Minus 5 e to the minus 2t u of t, okay. Plus 40 over 9 e to the minus 3t u of t, yes. Plus 10 over 3t e to the minus 3t u of t. So in other words, your time domain function f of t is going to be 5 nines minus 5 e to the minus 2t plus 40 over 9 e to the minus 3t plus 10 over 3t e to the minus 3t u of t. And the u of t, the unit step function is very important because your Laplace transform uh, is a one-sided Laplace transform. It's not a two-sided Laplace transform. And so the U of T is there for. Let me check if that's what I got. Yeah, that's what I get. Okay? So a common mistake which students make is they, like here, the Laplace transform of a constant, a DC, is actually, well, I don't want to say DC, a constant voltage, let's say, 5 volts, okay? You have a circuit, you apply 5 volts into it, that's represented as 5 U of T, okay? So it's actually 5 over S. Is that clear? There's no delta function here. That's my point. When you have a constant, it's actually a constant times U of T. It's something that is obvious, but something a lot of students struggle with. All right. Speaking about constants, let's look at the next part, which is the concept of a transfer function. Okay, FCN again is an abbreviation for function. So, a transfer function tells us how the input, very important, so I'll put this in red in the S domain, okay? You don't talk about transfer functions in the time domain. If I see you trying to find transfer functions in the time domain, I'm telling you right now, I'll give you a zero on the problem, right? I, because it doesn't make any sense. You can't find transfer functions in the time domain. It's not defined, right? And there's a reason why, you will see why, right? In S domain, whoops, is related or transferred I'll just use related, is related to the output. And this also in the S domain. How the input in the S domain is related to the output in the S domain. Actually, I'll leave this as red because it's also important Assuming zero initial conditions, so IC stands for initial conditions for the underlying differential equation. Whoops. Okay. 
So in other words, let's say I have a system and then I have an input x of t, this is h of t, it's the response, the impulse response, but we're not concerned about that, y of t, the first thing you do is you take the Laplace transform of this, x of s, you take the Laplace transform of this, y of s, then h of s is defined as y of s over x of s, okay? It's not y of t over h of t. Or, sorry, y of t over x of t, whatever. There's no time domain. It's an s domain definition. So basically, basically, the transfer function allows us to separate the input system. So here is the input. Here is the quote unquote system. Here is the output. Input system and output into three separate and distinct parts. Unlike the underlying. linear differential equation okay something important like we talked about last time this is only defined for linear systems okay transfer function for nonlinear systems there's something called transfer characteristic but we won't talk about that in this course so let's look at a couple of examples okay so let's look at uh, skill assessment two three on page 46 so here we'll do a differential equation okay and then we'll do a circuit. So you'll see how it's quote unquote useful. And it'll, that'll go in nicely with our next lecture. Find transfer function G of S is C of S over R of S. So C is the output, R is the input for, so here is, I'm just gonna use the dot notation. C triple dot means the third derivative of C with respect to time plus three C double dot plus seven C dot plus we talked about the dot notation last week, this is r double dot plus 4r dot plus 3r, okay? Note that this r means r of t, okay? It's implied they're functions of time. So the solution is, let's say we define the Laplace transform of c of t as c of s, and the Laplace transform of our r, which is our input, as R of S, okay? Now the question is, so what is the Laplace transform of C dot? So in other words, this is the Laplace transform of DC DT, and this turns out that this is actually the Laplace transform of DC DT is equal to, it turns out that this is S C of S minus little c at zero minus. That is, this is the value of the function right before the dynamics starts, okay? This is time domain, this is constant, okay? And you evaluate it from c of t, but it's a constant, so it makes sense to combine this, to combine a constant with the s domain. You can't add or subtract a time domain function to the s domain, they're not in the same domain. Is that clear? It's like trying to say this. Remember your circle? It's like trying to say x squared plus y squared equals one plus, let's say you want to find the intersection of a circle with a straight line. You can't do this, okay? Because these are in different domains. So this is a big no-no. So it's very similar to this, the equivalent of trying to add a time domain function to the S domain, but here you're not doing that, okay? This is a constant, is that clear? And then it turns out that Laplace transform of C double dot is S squared C of, whoops, C of S minus S C of zero minus minus C dot of zero minus. So you can see these constants are actually the initial conditions corresponding to this derivative, okay? That's how the Laplace transform incorporates the initial conditions. But obviously we're gonna zero this out. So let me just write 
the third one is Laplace transform of C triple dot is S cubed C ah, C of S minus S squared C of zero minus minus S I gotta be careful here C dot of zero minus minus C double dot of zero minus but recall that when we're doing Laplace transforms that I mean sorry I'm sorry when we're doing transfer functions okay we assume zero initial conditions so transfer function means defines zero ICs so the initial conditions all drop out okay therefore we simply take the Laplace transform of one using these ideas the Laplace transform of equation one simply becomes s cubed c of s corresponding to the triple dot plus three where do i get the three from i get it from here okay so it's three s squared c of s i mean laplace transform can handle initial conditions we're just computing the transfer function so we're zeroing it out three s squared c of s and what else plus seven s c of s then there is a 5c this is 5c of s so let me zoom out so this is clear right from here how i got this remember this is not 5 okay it's 5c of s it's another common mistake which students make which is equal to s squared r of s plus 4 oh, s r of s plus 3r of s okay in other words this is the beauty of the laplace transform what we now have for a transfer function h of s which is c of s over r of s output over input is s cubed oh no no c over r is going to be s squared plus 4s plus 3 divide by s cubed plus 3s squared plus 7s plus 5 okay let's see this is what I get yep okay so any questions on this that's the transfer function for this differential equation it's very straightforward but there are some observations which I would like to make from here okay. so is this clear So some observations, okay. Note that, so observation one is note that the degree of, so let's do this. Uh, let's call this, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna call this C over R, I'm just gonna call it N of S, numerator over D of S, denominator polynomial in S, okay. So note that degree of d of s what's the degree of the denominator three is greater than degree of the numerator okay. which is two this implies that system has an extra integrator i'll put this in quotes because it's not mathematically accurate but the idea is so the idea is let's say I have a system that's a pure integrator okay so X of T Y of T right in other words Y of T is integral x okay so you're integrating the input if you take the Laplace transform of this and if you go to your table I'm not gonna go to the tables it turns out that the integral the Laplace transform of the integral of a function given that the Laplace transform of the function is x is 1 over s times the function okay So this is easy to understand because note that 
if y is the integral x is the derivative of y yes if y is the integral of x what's the laplace transform of this again we'll assume zero initial conditions okay. what's the laplace transform of this assuming the laplace transform of x of t is capital x of s the laplace transform of y of t is capital y of s what's the laplace transform of this huh what's the laplace transform of the left hand side x of s what's the laplace transform of the right assuming zero initial conditions s y of s okay so and obviously y of s is 1 over s x of s okay so in other words a pure integrator is given by a pole at the origin okay so let's talk about that uh, notion thus a pole at the origin so pole means so poles are s values it's not only defined for transfer functions defined for any laplace transform or s values of uh, laplace of s such that laplace of s tends to infinity so in other words if it's a laplace transform is a polynomial okay it's the roots of the denominator is that clear that's defined as a pole so zeros that's a pole at the origin implies integrator so pole at the origin this s domain implies integrator in the time domain oops okay note that a zero of laplace of s or s values let's say z of s values such that well you don't have to make it such that laplace of s at the zero s equals z let's say tends to what zero okay so in other words the zeros of a polynomial transfer function sorry uh, zeros of a rational transfer function what am i saying so polynomial divide numerator polynomial divided by denominator polynomial are the roots of the numerator that's the zero okay so that's about it for transfer functions let's look at a practical example so let's say i have our friend the rc circuit i think your homework is in homework was an rl circuit so let's do rc just because okay so this was let's say vc is zero so here is vc of t let's say we had an initial condition just put an initial condition just for the hell of it be initial just to show you that laplace transforms can handle initial conditions no problem this was v of t u of t okay ah better okay so v of t doesn't have to be a constant it can be sine but it acts after t equals zero okay till t equals zero magically the capacitor stored some voltage and then you put in this forcing function so let's say the question is find an expression for vc of t so the solution is let's say you write out the differential equation assuming there's a current i flowing so v of t u of t okay is ir which is the voltage drop across the resistor plus vc of t okay but then this is v of t u of t is rc dv dt dvc dt because the current through the resistor is the same as the current through the capacitor and current through the capacitor is a linear capacitor so i is c dvc dt plus vc of t vc of zero is v initial now 
given this differential equation and given a specific v of t, you don't have to solve it in the time domain. You can just take the Laplace transform. Okay, so let's do that. Assuming v of t is some constant v d c. So let's take the so assume just to have a concrete example. We take the Laplace transform. So if this is a constant, what's the Laplace transform of the left hand side? Yeah, it's just VDC over S. Now, what's the, uh, now we're not going to assume zero initial condition. We're just going to leave it, okay? So what's the Laplace transform of the right-hand side? So R and C are constant, so they just pop out, okay? So assuming the Laplace transform of VC of T is VC of S, what's the Laplace transform of the derivative? So what do you do? So what's the Laplace transform of dvc dt? We just talked about it. So it's s times vc of s. Okay. So in other words, the derivative adds a zero at the origin in the s domain. The integrator added a pole. Okay. So it's s vc of s minus vc of zero minus. Okay. So let's make this zero minus to be more concrete. Okay. And that's V initial plus VC of S. So in other words, if the input is a constant, a DC, so what you get is VDC of S. Let's just write this out neatly. This is SRC, VC of S minus RC, VC of zero minus, which is a constant. VC of zero minus is a constant. The entire thing is a constant, actually. Right? Therefore, what do you get? We want vc of s yes so you have src plus one minus rc vc of zero minus yes therefore vc of s is going to be let me group the constant on one side so i'm going to move this to the left and i want to do simplification i get src plus one Okay, is the algebra clear? So let's keep going. Let's simplify this a little bit more. Okay. So VC of zero minus, I'm gonna factor out an RC that'll cancel with this RC. You'll see why I write it like this. Okay? The question is asking for VC of T. So let's keep going. In the sense, I'm gonna, this one, you can easily find the inverse Laplace transform of, okay? But this one, let's do a quick partial fraction expansion. I claim this is one over S, let's see. You don't have to, you can just eyeball what this is. So I'm, I think I'm off by a constant, let's see. So the, I have a, mm -hmm. so I claim, that's the partial fraction expansion. So I claim that this is the partial fraction expansion of this. Well, just do it in your head, right? So the common, the LCM is S times S plus one over RC. So if I do the simplification, I will get a one over RC here in the numerator from this. That goes nicely with the one over RC here, okay? It's very, very elegant. It works out really nicely. All right, now, Let's look at the inverse Laplace transform. Okay, so the inverse Laplace transform of this is simply VC of zero minus e to the minus t over RC, okay? Plus VDC, uh, let's put a U of t here, plus VDC times the Laplace transform of this is U of t, Laplace transform of this is e to the minus t over RC U of t. So I basically get this. So here is VC of T. Okay. So what is this called? This term, what is it called? 
mathematically what it's called if you have done differential equations you know what this is called it starts with an h homogeneous response or like we'll start calling it in this class zero input response it's the response of the system when the input is zero with only initial conditions you see that uh, vc of zero minus is v initial you can plug that in okay this is what is it called what is the analog of homogeneous what's this called mathematically what is this called it starts with an f o r force response it's a response due to an input or it's the zero state response in other words now in this class and from now on you should think about this initial condition as memory a state note however that this is not the transient response okay the transient response if you want so let me write that out as well it's a common mistake which people make i don't know why right so this is v initial e to the minus t over rc u of t okay plus vdc so if you multiply it out what do i get vdc u of t minus vdc e to the minus t over rc u of t okay so in other words i get vdc plus The whole thing multiplied by u of t yes remember this v final plus v initial minus v final that's what this is okay so this is the transient response this is steady state okay so in other words the laplace transform allowed us to derive all this without going through the differential equation and for a first order system this may be very obvious but this is very useful for second and higher order So again, these are the kind of things you should think about in this class. Like how, basically, not only this class, the entire, well, not only control systems, but any engineering sciences, whatever. How do you move between different domains? Okay, time domain to S domain. Okay. All right. So the final thing in this lecture, which I would like to do, so I got seven minutes. So it's MATLAB. Okay. So how about this? Um, I don't think I don't have time to connect my laptop. So let's do this. So the way I define transfer functions in MATLAB, this is not the only way you can do it. There are other ways. I define a transfer function object. Okay. So this requires the control systems toolbox, which you should have. So S is a transfer function variable. You don't have to call this S. You can call this BART, right? But that's not very useful. So S is transfer function of S. Now what I can do is I can define h as one over s plus one, for example, and then I can do I believe it's called i. Wait, is it called i plus? I don't remember. Right? I don't have MATLAB with me, so I can search for it on the internet. But you can do i plus of h. Okay, so look at help Laplace. I know there's a function called Laplace. Okay, so for your homework, and there is another way to do this. You can define the numerator and denominator. Let me see if I can. Where's my keyboard? Here's my keyboard, so I can move easily. To activate my keyboard. So, and I can scroll easily. So hopefully, my keyboard gets active pretty quickly. But let's see how the book does it. There's another way to do this. That is, there's another way to find. Oh, here it is. Uh, here, uh, to help you get. Uh, so this is for. This is not for Laplace transforms. This is for partial fraction expansion. But the point is, you can specify a numerator and a denominator polynomial, okay, and then use the transfer function. It's up to you how you want to do it. 
Let me see if my keyboard's active. Yeah, it's active. Mm, so let's see. So uh, 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 partial fraction expansion. Uh, no, it's not here. Yeah, here. Come on, zoom in. You can do it this way, okay? So you can transfer function of the numerator polynomial, which is three. The denominator polynomial is going to be s cubed plus two s squared plus five s. You see that? So you can do it like that. It's up to you. What do you want to do? Okay. So that's about it for today's lecture. So next time, what we will do is we'll start electric network transfer functions. We already saw a preview of it. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I'm assuming you're going to be familiar with this okay, from 2070. I want to spend more time on translational mechanical uh, functions, transfer functions, rotational mechanical functions. So that will be your exam one, okay, all this stuff. But after exam one is where you will see a very nice application, which is DC servo motor. Okay? So we'll derive the transfer function of an electromechanical system. And the reason why we do a DC motor is the mathematical model corresponds very nicely to the physical system. But you won't see that correspondence to 3720 when you actually do the lab. Okay. You'll put feedback around it, and you will basically do a position controller. Okay. So technically, this is not a servo motor. Okay. It's actually a DC motor, because servo implies you have feedback. Okay. For example, it could be AC feedback or DC feedback. But you don't make a servo motor in this class. Okay. Servo motor you make in 3720. So where you put feedback around the DC motor and make a position controller. So you might have played around with servos from Futaba, where right, you do RC and all that stuff. So you basically do PWM and you control the position. Okay, That's because a servo, if you ever ripped it open, you will see a feedback controller inside of it. That's in 3720, which we designed. But in this class, we'll make a very nice application. We'll, see, we'll study DC motors. Okay. So that's about it. See you tomorrow.